Hello, this is Carissa, and today I'm going to be doing a frequentist and Bayesian ANOVA. The data set that I'm using is uh, Kaggle data for campus recruitment, and it includes data on um, about 200 students from um, an XYZ campus and has information such as their degree spe specialization, um, work experience, uh, whether or not they were placed in a position, and their salary. So the research question I'm interested in understanding is um, how does gender and work experience impact salary? And so to do that, we'll go ahead and do an ANOVA starting with the frequentist ANOVA. So we'll go ahead and select ANOVA um, under the classical menu. Our fixed factors are gender and work experience and the dependent variable is salary. Um, so then before interpreting that, we'll go ahead and look at our descriptive statistics and we'll add an effect size measure to the table. Um, so first looking at our descriptive statistics, uh, it looks like we have um, more uh, females that do have work experience than females that do not have work experience, although the difference is not that large and same with males. And again, the difference is, uh, is comparable between the two groups. And then we can take a peek at our standard deviations and they are, um, there's more uh, variance in uh, the work experience category, but it's not um, extremely greater than the no, no work experience category. And we go ahead and look at the counts here. Um, we clearly have more males generally in our sample than females, um, but this is all interesting to know beforehand. So, um, now to look at salary, um, over here we have our cases or our variables that we entered and just automatically has the two main effects followed by the interaction. The sum of squares, our degrees of freedom and our mean square um, here. And then we have our F statistic and our P value. And if we're going based on traditional uh, 0.05 notions for alpha, uh, none of our p-values are below 0 0.05, and so therefore we would fail to reject the null hypothesis that gender and or work experience are different from the grand mean. And we could also look at our effect sizes here, and they're all extremely small. Um, so this is essentially saying we simply do not have enough information to determine if gender um, or work experience uh, impact salary. So to do the Bayesian ANOVA, we'll go ahead and select ANOVA. And then under the Bayesian heading, we'll select ANOVA. As before, our fixed factors are still gender and work experience, and our dependent variable is salary. And let's go ahead and compare to the null model. And we'll also look at our effect table. So as before, we have um, the models listed here with our null model. Um, gender, work experience, the two main effects, and then our interaction model. In this column here, we have our um, prior of the model or our prior model um, odds. And we can see here that it is equal because we are assuming that every model is equally likely before observing the data. This would also be known as a, a non-informative prior um, if we had information about gender and work experience relating to salary, we could specify that information um, in additional options with our prior. However, for the, case, uh, for the case of this example, we're just gonna go ahead and use the default settings. Although I highly encourage you to explore the benefits of using informed, thoughtful priors. And I could even leave um, some links down below for some useful reference papers on how to determine those. Here we have our posterior um, or our probability of the model now that we've observed the data. And as we can see here, we can look at how the um, odds changed once we observed the data. So here we have 0.2, here we have Point, uh, about 0.3, so it went up a little bit, not that much. Um, and a lot of these actually decreased, became less likely. Uh, here we have our base factor of the model odds, and this is our prior, or sorry, our posterior odds divided by our prior odds. Um, and these are here. And then what we really care about is our base factor, base 10. 
This is telling us um, how the models compare right now to the null model. So the null model compared to the null model would be one. Um, and then gender. So the null model compared to the gender model, um, we would say that the gender model is 1.0 uh, times better at explaining the data, which is really nothing that's considered anecdotal evidence. It's not enough evidence to determine if gender is, um, is really better at explaining the data or not relative to our null model, that there's no difference. Um, so let's go ahead and look um, at, to see how much uh, better the null model is compared to these subsequent models. So we'll go ahead and flip it. So we'll do a base factor zero one, which will give us information um, in favor of the null model. So we can see here that it looks like the null model is not substantially better, um, only anecdotally <laughs> better than the work experience model and the model with the main effects. However, it is moderately better at explaining the data than our interaction model. Um, these error percentages over here are essentially telling us that the algorithm, the underlying algorithm that came to the, um, to the conclusions is stable and anything less than 10% is considered sufficient. Uh, so now let's go ahead and see what the best model is. So we'll go ahead and compare it to the best model. And um, we'll go ahead and flip it. So now we'll put the best model on the numerator of our uh, marginal likelihood or a base factor equation um, so that any numbers that are um, greater than one are tell or in favor of our uh, best model. So in other words, we can interpret this uh, 7.23 base factor as meaning um, the gender model is 7.23 times better at explaining the data relative to the uh, interaction model. The gender model is 1.035 times better at explaining the data than the null model. And that should look familiar because if we go back and compare to the, uh, remember this 1.035, if we go back and compare to the null model, um, we see that again here. If we flip the base factor back so that the null model would be on the denominator and gender would be on the numerator. So in this case, um, none of the models are substantially great um, or best at explaining the data. So for the sake of parsimony, since we don't have compelling evidence that the gender model is in fact the best model, um, we may as well just conclude that we do not have enough evidence to determine whether the alternative um, models or the null model are best at explaining the data. And that's kind of reaffirmed by our uh, effects down here. We have gender, work experience, and the interaction term. The probability of inclusions are here. Um, this is again sums um, the in probability of inclusion and exclusion sum to one. And then we have our probability of inclusion given the data, exclusion given the data, and our overall base factor of inclusion, which is telling us if that term should be included in the model. And none of these are, um, sorry, let me flip it so it's a little bit more interpretable. We have evidence supporting we should not include the interaction term in the model, it's moderate evidence, 5.61, but we only have anecdotal evidence for excluding these terms. And so therefore we really don't have enough information to um, determine what would be the best model in this case. I hope that that's useful. This is a more um, confusing data set to work with because there's not a lot of clear um, answers, but it is still interesting to think about because in the Bayesian paradigm, we could have evidence to support our null model. We could have evidence to support a different model, or we might be somewhere in between, which is where we are in this case between um, one tenth and, or sorry, one over three and, um, and, and three, where that's kind of our range of anecdotal evidence where we don't have enough information to support either direction.